Greetings to everybody, either joining in live or watching later on YouTube, and we're very happy to welcome you uh, to the third in our autumn series of Invisible Histories Talks, and we're very happy, again, to welcome back Ralph Darlington. Ralph is the Emeritus Professor of Employ Employment Relations at the University of Salford, and he's going to be talking to us on the topic Strikers versus Scabs, violence in the 1910 to 1914 labour unrest. Uh, all of our talks are free, as, as uh, you all know, and I, I do my um, usual plug, which is to say that if you feel able to donate to us, then there is a donate button on our website, which we'd encourage you to, to go to afterwards. In the meantime, sit back and, uh, and enjoy Ralph's talk. Over to you, Ralph. Okay, I'll um, just put my presentation up, so. Everybody got that? Yeah? Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, thanks Lynette, and uh, thanks to the Working Class Movement Library um, for providing the opportunity to uh, talk about this subject. I mean, um, I'll, I'll start by saying that the um, when you look at um, historical analysis of strike activity that's been carried out over the years, um, generally, of course, what historians do is concentrate on two fairly obvious dimensions, namely the antagonism between workers and employers and the uh, uh, divergent interests between striking workers and full-time trade union officials. But what I really want to explore this afternoon um, is a third and what I think is rather neglected uh, dimension of union militancy. Um, and that, of course, is the relationship between strikers and non-strikers or scabs or blacklegs as they were colloquially known or even knobsticks in the uh, in the 19th uh, uh, century and in a same in a sense what this refers to is the way in which one of the most important functions of the picket line um, apart from obviously trying to stop the movement of goods and services in and out of a, a strike bound workplace is to act as a moral and physical deterrent to those workers, recalcitrant workers, who would attempt to go into work and undermine the solidarity of uh, strikers. And of course, those workers who do that are often subject to scorn, to contempt, to abusive language, which can on occasion escalate into an intimidation, uh, obstruction, and even sometimes physical uh, violence. In other words, I suppose what I'm saying is that a picket line is effectively aimed directly at non-striking workers as much as it is against employers. And in the process, the sanctity of the picket line has often been viewed um, by many trade unionist activists over the years as um, both a vital strike weapon, but also a key principle that must be respected. And therefore the mantra of um, thou shalt not cross a picket line effectively becoming an, an 11th uh, commandment for many uh, uh, workers. And now, you know, this has been true throughout the last 150 or 200 years. I mean, you can go back to the weaver strikes prior to Waterloo in the early 19th century, right through until the minor strike of 84 and 5 and beyond. And there are numerous strikes in which the violent dimension of the strikers versus scabs relationship plays itself out. What I want to do uh, this afternoon is really look at what I regard as being one of the most intense and graphic illustrative um, time periods. Uh, namely the uh, pre-First World War labour unrest between 1910 to 1914, in which I think picketing violence was a, a prominent and a recurring uh, phenomena. Now, you know, just by um, way of context, um, of course, this was an explosion of trade union militancy that involved uh, over 6,400 strikes, many of them national strikes that threatened the functioning of the economy. Um, something like 25 to 30% of the workforce were involved. Um, they were fighting for better wages and conditions in union organisation. And of course, it led to a spectacular increase in uh, not just the power of trade unionism, but trade union membership, which arguably surpassed in absolute, if not in relative terms, um, the, uh, the uh, strike achievements of the new unionist uh, strike wave of the late 1890s. 
And of course, the, the notable features of this labor unrest involve primarily un, uh, uh, unskilled or semi-skilled workers, some of whom were members of trade unions, but many of whom were not members, and therefore their battles for better wages and conditions often then revolved around the question of trade union recognition uh, against hostile employers. Um, these were strikes which largely took place independently uh, and unofficially of the national union leaders whose advocacy of compromise was really rejected in favour of militant strike action from below and it involved widespread questioning of the existing political system as workers found themselves um, coming into confrontation not only with intransigent employers and cautious union officials, but also the uh, uh, fierce opposition of, uh, uh, of uh, government officials, of magistrates, of the police, the troops and civic authorities and so on and so forth. And in the process of this, I think uh, many workers became disaffected with the parliamentary politics um, caused by the functioning of the newly formed Labour Party uh, effectively as an adjunct of the Liberal uh, government of the day. And as a result, if you like, the established rules of the game, piecemeal social reform by institutionalised collective bargaining and parliamentary reform from above and so on, was really widely questioned and put under considerable strain. Um, instead, what happened was that accumulated uh, grievances tended to explode into forms of widespread militant direct action taken by newly organised or unorganised workers determined to really compel employers uh, uh, to agree to better conditions and so on. And, and therefore it was a revolt that involved a, a quite a process of radicalisation, a counterculture um, that represented a, cel a, a celebration of working class solidarity, aggressive uh, 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 strike action and, ma and mass picketing and so on. Now, Inevitably, what this meant was that those workers who threatened to break the collective solidarity of strikers by crossing picking a picket line were viewed with, uh, as the mortal enemy who had to be stopped at all costs. And it's in, in this context that the violent dimension of the strikers versus scabs relationship really begins to uh, becomes, uh, becomes manifest. Now, um, let me look, first of all, at the question of the scabs and uh, uh, the opposition to them. Um, scabs, of course, who continued to work and um, uh, wanted to cross a picket line were motivated by different factors. I mean, th there was, you know, perhaps immediate in income needs, a uh, sense of fear of home responsibility or loyalty to employers or whatever. Although it, it would appear that some scabs, particularly those who were imported from outside, did it as an act of defiance against uh, unionism. Whatever their varied motives, it's clear that most scabs had little sense of solidarity with their fellow workers and saw the need, you know, basically for individual advantage as opposed to any sort of notions of, collect of collectivism. Now, in response, um, of course, in many, many disputes, strikers attempted to engage in peaceful persuasion and dialogue and reasoning, if you like, the, the sort of uh, the, the force of argument, uh, in order to try to convince them not to walk across the picket line and thereby break the strike. But often, particularly in circumstances, you know, circumstances made this not only highly problematic, but also virtually impossible, given the coalition of antagonistic forces that were arrayed against the strikers. And that for, therefore meant that defence of the picket line um, became really an end in itself that strikers attempted to achieve through sheer collective physical compulsion. And if you like, the argument of force. And of course, it's this which then leads uh, to repeated attacks on the scabs and, and so on. Now, you know, to give you some examples of this in the uh, uh, South Wales miners strike of 1910, um, often hundreds, if not thousands of, of miners would gather outside uh, the strike bound workplaces with mass pickets and uh, attempt to make it practically impossible for anyone to get into, uh, into work. And those who attempted to do so were assailed, were threatened, physically assaulted and so on. Uh, the Times newspaper at the time uh, reported the way in which groups of strikers would congregate at street corners to harangue and molest scabs on their way to the pit. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just reading out from here. They say, yeah, <clears throat> when one of these men was seen on his way to work with his jack of food, the strikers formed a cordon around him, very much in the same way as a scrummage is formed in rugby football. 
by this method of persuasion, man after man was turned back amid more or less excitement, which was proportionate to the amount of effort which he made to force his way through the crowd. And clearly, you know, in this type of mining community, any breaking of trust on the picket line and became a betrayal of the community as a whole. And the so-called blackleg, and in inverted commas, I'm using the colloquial term that was used at the time, uh, um, uh, was made a social outcast with the letters B, BL or SCAB uh, daubed on, on SCAB's houses. Uh, crowds of pickets, including women and children, would gather outside, throw stones and smash the windows of their, of their houses. Uh, likewise, during the 1911 uh, National Railway strike, pickets and their supporters held public meetings outside uh, the houses of scabs with windows broken in, neighbours called upon to, to, boycott, uh, to boycott them. Uh, during the 1911 London transport strike, it was reported that outside one scab's house, and again I, I'm reading uh, uh, the report, there was a band playing the Dead March, a van with gallows on it, the effigy of a man, and the representation of a hanging being carried out. Um, and what I think um, we find is that this intimidation and violence, if you like, became particularly manifest against scabs who managed to get into work or, and or were then involved in physically the moving of goods and services out of the strike-bound workplace to, to, uh, to wherever. This invariably involved pitch battles, uh, particularly, for example, in the waterfront strikes, uh, where strikers would attack uh, the at attempt by uh, uh, the scabs to move in, con you know, move goods and services, particularly perishable goods, from the to unload them from the docks, and then to move them to different warehouses and railway depots and so on. There'd be constant attempts by strikers in city after city to to assault scabs, to unload the carts, uh, uh, to turn them over, uh, to to uh, physically attack and prevent this type of attempt to break uh, uh, strikes. And picketing also involved acts of violence, if you like, against property. Uh, for example, in the uh, South Wales Miners' strike, uh, there were repeated attacks on scab-operated uh, pit head power stations and pumping stations uh, in, in some uh, pits. And when the uh, police forced strikers away uh, 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 from attempting to do this, then uh, strikers expressed their frustration and bitterness with street rioting, you know, which was to lead to the damage to about 63 shops in the, the local town of uh, Tony Pandy. Uh, in Hull, mass picketing by strike crowds and supporters would extend from physical attacks on scabs to uh, attacks on the offices of leading ship owners. And during the National Railway strike, in an attempt to stop uh, any movement of goods or services on the tracks that were being operated by scabs, there were numerous attacks on trains, on engine sheds, signal boxes, goods offices, uh, as well as the tearing up of tracks, the placing of obstacles on the line, the cutting of telegraph wires and so on and so forth. So um, this is what happened. Now on the screen, on the, the slide you've got here, uh, uh, the Daily Mirror, um, uh, and this is uh, a you know, fairly large number of Welsh miners who were scabbing on the strike, being guarded by uh, troops. Um, the next slide shows the reports from uh, the South Wales, the Rhondda Valley, uh, that followed uh, with the rioting in Tony Pandy, with the, with the damage that was being done uh, to the shops and so on. Um, and then, of course, in uh, Liverpool, uh, there was uh, rioting that occurred uh, uh, following uh, uh, the Bloody Sunday events, which I'll come to uh, again. And of course, here in Manchester and indeed in Salford, there's a period of about 48 hours when the whole series of mini riots, which occurred as a consequence of, uh, of scab labour being uh, uh, moved uh, by a convoy throughout the, uh, the, the city. OK, well, next. I want to obviously argue that picketing uh, violence during the labour unrest, I think was invariably a direct product, you know, and I've suggested in a sense as, as much, of employers' provocative attempts to break strikes by their active encouragement of existing workers uh, remaining in work and crossing the picket line, or by the external importation of blackleg, or inverted commas, uh, or scab uh, labour. Um, now, previously during the new unionist strike wave of the 1890s, the 
newly formed Shipping Federation had launched an offensive against the Dockers and Seamen's Unions by supplying scab labour to the shipping and the docks companies that were involved in disputes. And by such means, they were able to, to defeat a whole series of, of strikes in individual ports, notably in the port of Hull, which was one of the best organised at the time uh, in terms of trade unionism, uh, when they literally imported several thousand uh, so-called free labourers in order to, to break the strike that took place. Now, these employers' tactics were to be utilised during the, the labour unrest, except that they were to have much le less success. Partly this is due to the way in which the strikes on the docks and the ports spread uh, to all of the principal ports across the country rather than being isolated, but it was mainly due to the uh, determination, the willingness and the organisation of strikers to mount mass picketing to physically prevent the scabs from unloading goods and, and, uh, and, and, breaking, the, uh, and breaking the action that took place. Um, at the same time, when you look at other disputes, the violent dimension comes out less as a, as a consequence of external importation of, of scabs and more the way in which employers were encouraging their existing workers to remain in work. Um, in the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, rail strike, you get a beautiful report about uh, in Edinburgh, how strikers talking about the way they realised they needed to have pickets because of the intimidation that employers had placed on their workers to remain in work and to walk across the picket line. Intimidation coming from the employer to impel them uh, uh, to do this. Of course, in some cases, strikers, for example, in the uh, uh, were being offered and induced to do so by uh, having their pay increased by 50%, 100% or whatever, uh, even though previously the employers had refused any uh, uh, demands by the unions for pay increases. Um, to give you an example of this, in the 1913 Leeds Corporation worker strike, the local authority employers were able to uh, uh, force their clerks, their supervisory staff to maintain a skeleton municipal service by acting as strike breakers um, in the, on the trams, in the uh, uh, gas works, the electrical power stations that even provided a food and accommodation for the scabs at their places of work. Um, 200 of the 600 students of the newly formed Leeds University, with the support of their vice chancellor, were also encouraged to act in this scab uh, 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 function. Now, as a result of this type of violence, uh, during the period of the labour unrest, I mean, one historian, uh, Henry Phelps Brown, sort of argued that um, the violence generally was impulsive rather than premeditated bitterness, not adopting therefore violence as a policy as such, uh, but in the face of employers' attempts to encourage uh, a, a scabbing that was perceived as pouring salt into the open wound as strikers crossed picket lines and literally took over workers' jobs, then what was happening was that pickets were often acting spontaneously, essentially, uh, on the basis of aroused impulses and acting sometimes in totally unexpected and what otherwise might have been regarded as being uncharacteristic behaviour. And I'll come back to this in a moment or so, but I think it should be noted that in both the National 12 uh, national miners and, and 1914 London building workers strikes. Um, these generated much fewer incidences of picketing violence or social confrontation on the streets compared with many other, particularly the larger disputes. And it seems to me that this was directly linked to the relatively less proportionate occurrence of scabbing uh, uh, that took place. Um, so this is the employers. This, by the way, is um, on the left is one of the leading uh, uh, railway uh, magnets. And um, on the right, of course, is the infamous William Murphy, who was the, uh, the head of the transport companies that locked out the Dublin workers in 1913. Um, next, of course, a fundamental extra uh, contributory element to the violence was the way in which in many disputes, both the police and the military displayed their primary duty as the defence of the employer's property and the enforcement of managerial rights uh, over, uh, 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 over the employment relationship and unequivocally participating in industrial disputes against the strikers. 
and therefore an habitual immediate stimuli of, the, of violence on the picket line was the deployment, for example, of, of large detachments of police, and often this would be not just the local police force, um, for example, in, the, in Manchester, uh, they would be drawn, extra forces would be drawn from across the whole of the northwest into the city, and, and sometimes including metropolitan police officers, and their direct role in providing a physical escort to um, enable the scabs to enter into the strike-bound workplace, and thereby necess necessarily also, therefore, denying strikers the right to exercise any form of peaceful persuasion with these people. And therefore, ironically, violence uh, regularly occurred not as a result of picketing per se, uh, but of action by the police to curtail it, and notably the extreme levels of violence that were displayed against pickets who then challenged them. Uh, and you see this, for example, in the South Wales Miners dispute, uh, one of the key pits there was transformed into a near fortress uh, with the police placed at the service of the mining companies uh, to protect the scab labour and uh, uh, police responding furiously, uh, ferociously to mass picketing attempts to stop stop the scabs uh, from getting the, keeping the pits working. Uh, baton charges, fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, uh, with one miner fatally bludgeoned over the head, numerous other casualties, and it was this of course which led to the legendary riots in, in Tony Pandy. Um, then, uh, following uh, Winston Churchill, who was Home Secretary at the time, he dispatched troops into the area uh, uh, to buttress the police. There were sporadic clashes that occurred over many, many weeks uh, with the troops who were now billeted on the colliery owners' properties, armed with rifles, with fixed bayonets and ball cartridges and so on, actively assisting the police in order to assert, uh, reassert control. Uh, one of the uh, strikers, John Edwards, uh, recounted. Our area was invaded by soldiers. Soldiers had been sent to intimidate the people and in consequence to break the strike. The area was like an armed camp. The soldiers embarked on regular patrols to look for trouble and to make it if they couldn't find it. Uh, Keir Hardy, the local Merthyr Tidville MP, uh, tried to raise the conduct of the police and the military in South Wales, talking about the reign of terror that had been imposed in the area, talking of the rushification of the troops and so on. He demanded a public inquiry and of course this was uh, to be rejected. Um, likewise, during the National Seamen's and Dockers strikes of, of, of 1911, both police and troops uh, were dispatched with violent confrontations with pickets uh, on the waterfronts of the surrounding areas of, of places like Liverpool, London, Hull, Salford and Manchester, Glasgow, Bristol and Cardiff uh, 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 that were to occur. In, in Liverpool, of course, in 1911, uh, 3,000 troops, uh, several hundred police were dispatched to the city, uh, a Royal Navy gunship was positioned on the River Mersey, and the police infamously uh, bludgeoned uh, workers uh, uh, with mounted police to attack a demonstration in, uh, in, uh, uh, outside St George's Hall, uh, and this was to lead to the rioting, which then led to the, the shooting de dead of two workers, a docker and a carter, by, uh, by troops. Um, in the London in the 1912 uh, London transport strike, um, with literally thousands of imported uh, labourers working in, under protection in the port, it was the Metropolitan Police now who played an absolutely central role in protecting the strike breakers. And there were numerous scab-driven food convoys being escorted from the docks to the, to the markets, in which uh, again, uh, this you know the, uh, the pickets attempted to stop uh, uh, physically. I mean, the Home Office documents show uh, the way that the metro, you know, the level of detail of the Metropolitan Police provided. I mean, for example, in the month of June, it says that they protected en route to Smithfield Market 187 convoys comprising 8,600 uh, vehicles. And, you know, this goes on because if you think of the 1913 Dublin uh, transport workers lockout, uh, again, police viciously bat and charge and, and uh, fatally kill two workers uh, in, who were protesting at the importation of English labour to break the strike. Um, you look at the National Railway strike. 
Um, almost all of the country's 58,000 troops were uh, dispatched to strategic railway centres right across the country and, and virtual martial law declared. Uh, this led to repeated clashes in many parts of the country, of course in Clenethley in South Wales. Um, so soldiers marched out with fixed bayonets to seize back control of the level crossing. Uh, that had been taken over by pickets in an attempt to stop the scab movement of trains up and down. Uh, and when the crowd rained a fusillade of, uh, of stones and slates and so on, the soldiers, uh, the order to shoot uh, was given and two, work, two railway workers were shot uh, dead. So I think what all of these examples underline is the way in which it's the character of intervention by the police and the army in the labour unrest combined with the employer's strike-breaking uh, scab operations that I think is primarily responsible for the violence that occurred. Uh, and uh, uh, of course their conduct in assisting scabs and employers was clearly designed not so much to suppress disorder as to suppress the strikes uh, and the effect of the, of the, uh, the mass picketing. Uh, the fact that on the slide by the way is, um, is, uh, is the South, is South Wales. Uh, dispute and the array of, uh, of uh, troops that were marshalled uh, there. Here's um, <coughs> another uh, picture of the police uh, swearing in uh, in order that they can be involved in the strike breaking operation uh, around the pits in South Wales. Um, here's some of the uh, scenes that occurred in uh, Liverpool following the attacks uh, that the police had launched on workers there. Um, and here are, is the Daily Mirror for the battles that took place in Manchester and in Salford when, as I say, strikers attempted to stop police protected convoys uh, of scab, of scab labour. And this one is in London uh, in 1912. And again, you can see the sheer number of vehicles that are being uh, escorted by uh, the police. And finally, um, in the National Railway strike, um, troops dispatched all the major stations. The, the photo on the left is outside Liverpool Lime Street. And then equally inside, uh, on the right hand side, you can see the way the troops aren't just protecting the scabs, they're actually helping to unload the material itself. Okay, well next, I think further contributing to the picketing violence in many industrial disputes was the role of the Liberal government and their active support for these strike-breaking initiatives that were being taken. Now, of course, you know, the justification they gave for intervention in some of the larger, you know, particularly national industrial disputes was the need to keep public order, maintain essential services and to safeguard the functioning of the economy. But of course, what they were doing was actually encouraging hardline police action against picketing and supporting or indeed authorising the deployment of troops in a number of different disputes in order to protect scab labour. Uh, so for example in the Siemens and Dockers strikes, uh, Churchill, the Home Secretary, insisted that it was the duty of the local civic authorities not only to maintain order but to secure the unloading of perishable cargoes in effect positively encouraging the police and, the, and also the military uh, to strike break in order to counter the effect of widespread uh, picketing. Um, in the National Railway strike it's absolutely clear that you know unlike uh, 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 Asquith's uh, the Prime Minister here on the left hand side and they slide. Um, he claimed that the, the government was just an impartial arbiter simply trying to hold the ring between the contending parties. The fact of the matter is that the government saw its duty as being to uh, uh, um, uh, really uh, uh, support uh, the, 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 the scab workers who were being employed by the railway companies and, and thereby by to unequivocally put, them side, put themselves on the side of capital against uh, labour. Um, the Home Office in 1911 um, issued a, a circular which was sent to all the police 
chiefs around the country. It was, it was titled Intimidation During Trade Disputes, and in which they outlined the need for the police to take aggressive action against what is perceived to be intimidatory uh, picketing, and by which they mean virtually any, any picketing that's more than five or six pickets. And this official government guidance, it's clear, led to many arrests, to prosecutions, to convictions that involve fines and, uh, and even imprisonment. And it both stimulated and provided justification for the ongoing police violence that appeared clearly in many disputes to exceed uh, any of that that you know might have been uh, uh, leveled at the strikers themselves. Um, uh, the other people in the picture, if you've not guessed, is Lloyd George, uh, Wiley jo Lloyd George in the middle, and then of course Churchill uh, uh, on the right. <clears throat> okay, now I want to come back to the question of uh, spontaneity and so on, because despite the overall unofficial character of the labour unrest, uh, that I mentioned, it seems to me that the subjective encouragement of strike militancy by certain militant uh, strike leaders that both implicitly, if not explicitly, included support for intimidation and violence against scabs could also be a contributory factor in the equation, at least in some individual um, disputes. Um, if you look at the Liverpool General Transport strike, the chairman of the strike committee, and of course the leader of the revolutionary industrial syndicalist education league, Tom Mann, um, really, uh, you know, he was renowned for his fiery and unequivocal hostility to scab labour. Uh, on one occasion when a, uh, it was clear that there was a shipload of strike breaking workers that had arrived on the River Mersey, he was reported as saying, and I quote, if that boat were sunk before she had time to moor correctly, he would for his part rejoice. If he were able to sink the ship himself, he would do it. As for the scabs on board, the sooner they went to heaven or hell, according to which they were most fitted, the better for the world. And, you know, it seems clear to me that belligerent statements of this kind on the part of man and other uh, uh, strike leaders, uh, you know, could encourage aggressive forms of rank and file action. Um, a similar process took place during the 1912 uh, London dock strike um, here on the slide uh, when after repeated clashes between uh, strikers and blacklegs and police uh, and the uh, intransigence of the employers in terms of refusing to make concessions the flamboyant strike leader uh, ben Tiller became increasingly militant in his speeches at the mass meetings that, which were held and he was reported as, as saying at one uh, demonstration in Hyde Park uh, and I quote he did not want to utter any threats but if they could not win by peaceful means if the capitalists and the government said that they should not have the right to live then they must take the power into their own hands we must use other means and I openly state here that the only means we have to use is violence and the use of every physical power we have. So in a sense, I suppose what I'm saying is that this suggests the outbreaks of mass, uh, 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 you know, of attacks on, on scabs and so on, in, at least in the waterside disputes, might not have been as entirely uh, sudden or spontaneous as at first appeared. And, you know, one might argue that the uh, 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 influence of the syndicalist activists of the unofficial reform committee of the South Wales Miners Federation um, in fanning the flames of militant uh, action uh, might not also have been completely inconsequential here. However, um, you know, let me hasten to add that I think there is, of course, a danger of exaggerating such influence because, of course, syndicalism was frequently blamed by the press and by the government for the strikes and for the violent uh, disorders uh, more generally. Now, you know, certainly whilst its philosophy of militant direct action from below <coughs> uh, that bypassed the orthodox collective bargaining machinery and the class collaboration as it was seen of the official union leaders fell on fertile ground uh, during the strike wave and its leadership influence in uh, certain uh, uh, disputes was you know completely out of proportion to their numerical strength the fact of the matter is that syndicalist influence generally was inside the labor movement was a minority phenomena and there's no evidence that syndicalists actively encouraged violence as a policy or indeed participated in any acts such as rioting or physical you know attacks on physical property 
Moreover, I think we should know the, the sheer breadth, the intensity of the militancy, the aggressive attacks on scabs and other forms of violence that took place in the labor unrest actually took the vast majority of the official trade union leaders completely by surprise. It invariably displayed an unofficial impulsive dynamic in which actually the rank and file on occasion went much further uh, than even some of the most mo local militant strike committee leaders were prepared to approve or anyway able to control and you know this was the case uh, in uh, in South Wales where the strike committee disassociated itself from some of the actions which took place uh, equally in Clenethley where one of the leading uh, local officials appealed to strikers you know to let to relinquish their control over the uh, the level crossing before the the uh, the police uh, the army came in and again was it was defied by uh, by rank and file uh, by rank and file strikers okay um next i think a um important underlying feature of the aggressive challenge mounted by strikers to the legitimacy of public order and state power was the way it led to deep levels of social polarization inside working class districts. Um, if you like, a social crisis between local communities in which the strike bound workplaces were located on the one hand and employers and representatives of civil authority on the other that led really to a serious uh, questioning of traditional patterns of behavior and allegiance and therefore in the process, what you see is a, 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 a culture of community solidarity, aggression and self-defense that involved not just the relatives and the friends of those who were directly involved in strikes, but also many local trade unionists and others as well in the area who were mobilized to be involved in the picketing, in the direct action against the scabs, uh, uh, you know, notably in the face of, uh, of the hostile uh, civil and military uh, forces that were being uh, uh, um, <coughs> that were being uh, deployed to disperse the pickets. Now, you know, you see this played out in different ways in the South Wales miners' strike. Uh, large segments of the working class communities in the area, uh, notably women and children, played an absolutely key role in the mass picketing of attempting to stop scabs. Um, women were involved in showering boiling water over the heads of police officers. They would collect stones in their aprons in order to relay, uh, uh, provide relays of ammunition to the pickets to throw at the, the police and the military. Uh, when you look at the national transport and the railway strikes, as well as many other local disputes in which I don't have time to explore, there's a overwhelming support from local working class communities on picket lines and on the streets in confronting the scabs. Uh, more locally, uh, in 1911, the Horwich locomotive uh, work strike um, women play an absolutely central role on the picket line uh, and in many demonstrations, hundreds of them involved uh, trying to attack scabs as they come into work, uh, when the police attempt to, uh, to intervene, uh, fighting with the police, throwing things at the police. Uh, at one uh, at mass meeting, a male striker had to get up and he's reported as calling on the women to be more ladylike, inverted commas. Um, and it's interesting that you find the way in which, you know, press reporting of some of the strike violence that took place, particularly in some of the riots in Tony Pandy and Liverpool, in Cardiff, in Hull, London, Manchester, and Clenethley, and so on, um, they tended to suggest the hand of so-called outsiders and anti-social sort of hooligan ele elements with the participation of any small number of tickets. Now, you know, the fact of the matter is when you look at many, you know, a number of studies that have been carried out, um, what they show is that whilst these um, activities certainly involved a wider cross-section of the community than the strikers directly involved themselves. Um, this was composed mainly of local working class people from a range of different occupations uh, as opposed to some outside or habitually unemployed or criminal underclass. And when you look for example at the people, you know, the largest segment of, of, uh, of participants in the Clenethley riots, that's actually template workers who were trade unionists and who were reciprocating the solidarity which they'd received from the miners uh, to be on the on the picket on the picket line. Um, okay so this is I mean I love this front page here uh, you know the women's part in the Liverpool riots the viragos <laughs> encourage the men. Uh, <coughs> um, one thing I don't have time to explore is of course the way that these 
this picketing and, and so on attacks on scabs spreads to strikes by young school children uh, in about 61 centres across the country and of course they also uh, utilise many of the lessons which they've witnessed and, and learnt from their uh, 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 older counterparts uh, with a, a, attempts to encourage uh, people who, uh, who don't abide by that principle uh, uh, as well. I, I don't have time to look at that. Um, okay, before I begin to wrap up, um, among the sort of rapidly growing numbers of women workers um, who took strike action during the labour unrest, it's clear to me that many appear to have been influenced and emboldened both by the growing industrial struggles in which their predominantly male counterparts in the trade unions were involved, but also by the militant women's suffrage movement of the period, in which, of course, the suffragettes, the women's social and political union, uh, in, uh, 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 with their, uh, who were in, you know, involved in dramatic forms of so-called deeds, not words, in pursuit of votes, uh, played a central role. And, you know, you know the story of the suffragettes, uh, they uh, physically assaulted ministers of the Liberal government, uh, they smashed the windows of uh, West End uh, stores, they blew up letterboxes, there were arson attempts to attack well-known country buildings, they slashed artwork in galleries and so on and so forth. And in the process, and of course this was running alongside all of this, this strike period, it seems to me the overall, as a consequence, the overall weakening of traditional respect for law and order and constitutional behaviour that characterised the militancy of both the suffrage and the labour movements of the period, clearly you see this reflected in the way in which many workers, many women worker strikes uh, that took place across the country were not only very assertive, but also often very aggressive in terms of mass picketing, uh, the verbal abuse, the physical assaults on strike breakers, the fights with the police and so on. And I've looked at, you know, I don't have time to go into the details, but many strikes of this kind. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the Dundee Women Spinners Strike of 1912, uh, lar uh, large detachment of police had to be called out because the, the women pickets were assaulting uh, scabs. Uh, when the police attempted to intervene, they themselves are roughly uh, handled, they're pelted with sticks and stones and other missiles and so on, resulting in several officers being uh, injured. During the 1913 Black Country Metal uh, worker strikes. Uh, five young girl strikers are imprisoned for alleged intimidation of scabs. Um, during the 1913 Bliss Tweed Mill uh, strike in Chipping Norton, a whole number of strike related incidents uh, in which there were assaults on scabs, on the police, so called riotous behaviour that was taken to uh, court. Um, one of the women strikers was found guilty of assault on a strike breaker and she was sentenced to 14 days in prison but when she came out she was met uh, with a th by a thousand jubilant supporters and she was actually presented with a silver teapot which was inscribed to commemorate the occasion and she was then paraded through the streets in a wagon pulled by the strikers accompanied by a brass band and greeted by a pack meeting at the uh, town hall. Um, so on the slide here you've got the suffragettes uh, obviously this is being attacked. Um, here's one of the great uh, strikes that took place in Bermondsey in South East London. Many of these strikers were wives of dockers who were involved uh, themselves in strikes and therefore there was you know a tremendous amount of affinity be between the two in terms of the lessons that were being learned. And here's an absolutely wonderful uh, front page which I discovered. Um, I can't be absolutely sure, but, I, you know, I, I put 99% on it that this is a Bermondsey striker addressing a mass meeting of dockers within in Tower Hill. You know, magnificent uh, uh, demonstration here of what was taking place. Um, and this is, the, is a picture of the Bliss Tweed Mill strike where the woman who went to prison uh, is given the inscribed teapot. Okay. Um, One or two words on the limits and the potential of this picketing violence against scabs with reference to the sort of outcome of the dispute. It seems clear to me that on the one hand, mass picketing to stop scabs contributed enormously to the overall level of workers' successes. 
uh, in terms of winning pay increases and so on and so forth that took place during this period, uh, leading to a spectacular growth in the total power of organised labour and to the level of trade union membership. And, you know, again and again, in many different disputes, employers attempt to undermine strike action, either by importing labour from outside or by encouraging workers internally, often backed by the police and the troops, is effectively thwarted by the sheer level of strikers' mass picketing organisation, determination and willingness to engage in militant forms of behaviour uh, that was often, of course, uh, received uh, a, a large degree of community, uh, uh, community uh, backing. On the other hand, uh, there were clearly limits to this picketing activity uh, in a number of disputes. I mean, for example, with the, the London uh, 1912 transport workers strike, uh, the effective failure to turn that into a national dispute uh, left the workers isolated and their position undermined and with uh, strikers and their families increasingly pushed to the margins of starvation, the number of, of uh, scabs uh, increased enormously from about 5,000 to 19,000, eventually forcing the strike committee to call off the dispute completely defeated. Uh, during the 1913 lease Dockers strike in, in Scotland. Uh, the employers, with the assistance of the Shipping Federation, successfully brought in 600 so called free labourers uh, housed on two of their ships, and then at the same time, uh, uh, the police were able to restrict pickets to only six within the dock perimeter walls with the assistance of the police. Uh, again, this made it effectively impossible for the strikers to, to prevent the scabs from undermining the dispute, and again, this went down to defeat. I mentioned the Leeds Corporation Workers' Strike of 1913 with the uh, uh, encouragement of their existing workers and students to scab. And of course, this also meant that the strike was defeated. And of course, one of the most notable defeats was that of the 1913 Dublin lockout. Um, the inability to halt the movement of scabs predominantly from England, uh, combined, of course, with the relative lack of solidarity uh, from the British Labour movement, I mean, there was rank and file solidarity, but not sufficiently from the official levels, also meant that that went down to, uh, to defeat. Um, and this is the, on the slide, uh, the pictures of the police attacking uh, workers in Dublin. Okay, my final comments are these, that um, it seems apparent that the violent methods which were used in the conduct of disputes um, were viewed at least by a significant minority of strike participants as legitimate and necessary if victory was to be achieved. <coughs> um, working class violence, such as physical assault on scabs and even rioting to some extent um, as a form of active defence could be justified by the way in which it was directly provoked by the employer's provocative use of scabs and the partisan intervention of the police and the troops in attempting to defeat workers' struggles. And in a context in which employers had often systematically defeated earlier attempts at strike activity by strike breaking, then the perceived failed methods of moderation and respectability championed by the official union leaders were really swept aside and replaced with unbridled militancy, sometimes going, as we've seen, even further than some of the most militant strike committee leaders were prepared to countenance. It became widely accepted that the only way that the employers and the state's determined resistance to union organisation could be broken down was by militant and aggressive forms of strike action, accompanied, if and when necessary, by what we might term demonstrative violence, uh, to discourage scabbing and to ensure that picket lines were scrupulously respected. And, you know, my final point would be this, that although it's clear that strikers dispense violence, as a form of collective self-defense against the combined forces of the scabs of employers, the police, the military and the civil authorities and the government, actually they were overwhelmingly uh, uh, the recipient of intimidation and violence from these combined forces. Um, finally, can I just acknowledge um, the British Newspaper Archive is a wonderful resource from which some of the slides have appeared and for which I'm grateful to, to them for the use of these. Okay, I'll stop it. I'll stop it there. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed.
and uh, if you can if you get back you will see that people are, are showing their appreciation albeit silently um, i'm struggling to know how to close this down without losing me there's a view option view options up at the top there i think maybe that's going to oh, yeah yeah uh stop share right that's it that's okay. it I'm good. I'm back. there you go yeah and and we're back so yes here you go with people saying thank you very much indeed and and, and there's been um particular mention in the chat of the quality of the images now you you mentioned there about the newspaper archive um uh jeff brown asks what do we know of who took the photos what with exactly and where the photos are archived i think you may have answered the last one but but uh, yeah people are particularly interested in uh, in in those um well i don't i've no idea who took the photos i mean uh i mean um the i'm i'm sort of uh in the obviously because of lockdown and the inability to sometimes go to archives i uh, although i knew of the british newspaper archive i mean it's one of the sort of you know the quirks of of lockdown isn't it that many things have been digitalized um now on a much more you know broad and significant scale than was previously the case and this is true of that archive and there are literally hundreds of newspapers available uh, many of them have, have newly you know rel relatively newly gone up um and i mean it's a, a wonderful resource really i mean i've looked at numerous newspapers um both local and the national newspapers through that means and elsewhere um the reason i've used a lot of the daily mirror is is not because not because necessarily their reportage is the best but it's because unlike in most newspapers as you will appreciate of the day tended to be fairly dense in terms of print so and of course they're large papers so you know there's there's no photos there's no pictures there's no drawings or everything like or even headlines that that or, or you know the headlines are very small the daily the daily mirror you know is a more of a sort of seem to be more of a slightly if you might say tabloid form um and they you know quite often their front pages are just sheer photos so that lends itself to to so useful images for, for for the slides um but yeah i mean i you know i'd never seen any of these uh shots myself and right. it's great to see some of these uh, to see some of these you know being reported absolutely so frank asks do the lincoln riots of 1911 fall into this pattern and he said he mentions a community play he went to have devils let loose by pat nurse that, that he went to about that uh, those riots i think they do i mean i'm not uh, i'm not i don't know a great deal about those to be honest but i think they are very much part of the general uh, um, phenomena yeah yeah Oh, and uh, yeah, Frank is is waving. Do you, do you want to unmute yourself, Frank, and just tell us about this? Hi. It's a long time since I went to the play. It's not a well-known part of the city's history or of Labour history. There's a small town, industrial town like that did have very serious riots in 1911 related to strikes, and that's the book. If you haven't got it, lift it, lift it up a bit more, Frank. So there, there we go. Uh, uh, a bit further back, <laughs> devils let devils let loose. You said, didn't him? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you want me to put the full time? Yeah, stick it in the chat. Stick it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Thank you. Um, so we are getting some good questions in, Ralph. So can you say a bit more, says Rose, about the reaction of the Labour Party to the strikes? Well, obviously. Um, the Labour Party were really caught in a difficult situation. <laughs> um, the, um, I mean, generally you had this, you had the problem that Labour um, found um, the idea of sort of uh, you know they they formally gave support to the idea that workers should win you know have successfully won uh, improved wages and conditions through strike activity and so on and at Labour Party conferences you get resolutions acknowledging this but of course all the key leaders Ramsay MacDonald, Philip Snowden uh, um, and so on um, are very very unhappy and very hesitant about the idea of, of the something being unleashed here which is of, an, of such an extra parliamentary kind that it not only um, 
undermine, you know, that essentially undermines and threatens the electoral credibility of the Labour Party. And so they're, they're not at all happy with that. I don't uh, have, you know, direct uh, uh, quotes in terms of the rioting or, or violence as such, but even in terms of the strikes, they're, they're quite distanced from this. I mean, the ILP, the Independent Labour Party, uh, again, is caught in between, on the one hand, wanting to be seen to be on the side of working class struggle, but on the other hand, seeing that as merely secondary and subordinate to parliamentary representation and electoralism, and therefore also guarded in terms of their support. Having said that, you know, numbers of, of IL, particularly ILP uh, members, uh, played quite a role in a number of disputes in a number of different parts of the country. They throw their weight behind strikes. They're involved uh, both as individuals on strike themselves, but also in terms of support groups. Um, but a bit like, you know, the Labour Party in 1984-5 minor strike, you can have this disjuncture between Neil Kinnock and the Labour Party's parliamentary position um, and the role and activism and solidarity displayed by, you know, socialists inside the Labour Party at a sort of rank and file level. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question which brings us even more up to date than that. Uh, can we see any characteristics of syndicalism in the reaction of working class communities, particularly but not solely in the North, to the recent general election, vote on EU membership and general reaction to mainstream politics? How long have you got, Rob? <laughs> Uh, no, I if the if the question sorry if the question is are there syndicalist overtones in today contemporary times then 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 I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, of course, what there may be, you know, I mean, one of the one of the characteristic features of syndicalism, of course, is its sort of antipathy towards parliamentary change, parliamentary action, and that's because. The Labour Party is review, viewed as being ineffective, ineffectual, and you know bankrupt and and sort of reformist-minded and so on. Whereas it's through direct forms of industrial struggle that workers can achieve change. Um, I don't see any evidence of that of a similar you know that sort of being replicated in today's world. Although I suppose what you could say is that, you know, there no doubt there is a serious questioning as to the efficacy of, par of Parliament and parliamentary change. And, you know, one of the phenomena of the last 10, 15 years or so, isn't it, has been street movements, you know, social movements uh, against racism over the issue of the, the environment and so on uh, um, and other issues in which people have taken action from the streets and don't look necessarily towards Parliament as the most important channel for the, for that forms of protest. So I suppose in that sense, there's a, there's a continuity, but to in any way suggest that syndicalist as such, you know, I think would be a, 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 mis, a misuse of the, of the, of the team and of the term and the meaning of the, of the movement, the original movement. Okay, thank you. Um, can you say something about the numbers of strikers arrested and the sentences given by the courts? Is it possible to say when state repression succeeded in defeating strikes and when it failed? I mean, it's impossible. I, I've not been able to, you know, uh, collect. I mean, uh, uh, local police forces may well have kept, well, it might have kept records of the numbers that were arrested. I mean, you can go to individual disputes. So for example, there's work that's been done on those that were arrested uh, in Liverpool in the rioting that took place following Bloody Sunday, tracking uh, the individuals that were involved and where that precisely they lived. I mean, that was Sam Davis, did a you know, beautiful piece of research. Um, I mean, I've not done anything, you know, of that kind. And I mean, because I'm looking at the the nature of the rest on a, of the unrest across uh, Britain and Ireland. Um, you know, that level of detail I've not been able to to explore. Maybe if you were to collate from different areas, you could track more more uh, so. But it seems clear to me that the um, the encouragement that's been given to the police uh, 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 and to the army indeed at such official government levels um, undoubtedly contributes to the extent to which people are being apprehended and, and, and charged with you know with with offenses and um, magistrates you know often deal with this extremely harshly I mean, of course 
you know, the, the paradox is that in South Wales around the, the, the miners dispute, um, many of the magistrates were themselves mining owners, you know, I mean, um, so the, the impartiality of these magistrates, you know, was seriously placed under question. Um, elsewhere in the country, you see the way in which in the 1911 transport strikes, um, uh, the, it's the local magistrates as well as the local civic authorities who are the ones who are most concerned at the level of violence calling for uh, to the Home Office, sending letters to the Home Office, requesting troops be sent, greater reinforcements of police are put onto the streets and so on. And these are the very people who then subsequently uh, uh, make judgments on strikers who are involved in, in alleged intimidation and so on. So you can appreciate, you know, the un unlikely nature of, their, of any sympathies being directed in, in that quarter. Okay. D did the militancy of the strikers result in increased political activity within the communities, not only in relation to the Labour Party, but for the other more revolutionary parties? It, it, it did. Um, and again, this is a feature which I'm trying to, you know, look at. Um, I mean, of course, you know, the role of the, I mean, first of all, you, you have the syndicalist left, the, the revolutionary syndicalists who, although not a large number of supporters um, at any one time, nonetheless um, had an influence, you know, which was completely out of proportion to their numerical strength because beyond their existing, um, you know, individual supporters. They had influence in many different unions, in different uh, rank and file amalgamation committee sort of movements. They had influence within the Pleb, Plebs League and the Plebs magazine. Um, they had influence within um, uh, uh, um, the, the, the Daily Herald newspaper, the editor of which was very syndicalist inspired, um, and so on and so forth. And also um, the, the revolutionary left, excuse me, the radical left had uh, numbers of members who were influenced by, you know, by syndicalism as well. Um, the, the radical left, you know, I mean, I, it's difficult to give a sort of brief answer, but I mean, of course, you know, they, they were both handicapped in a sense. I mean, on the one hand, again, they played uh, a significant role in some respects in terms of their attitude and their intervention around certain disputes. Um, you know, the Socialist Labour Party, which was a fairly tiny organisation, but which saw the, the importance of, of workers' struggles to uh, social change, um, you know, played an important role around certain disputes, notably the Singer sewing machine factory. But of course, they were handicapped very much by a very sectarian approach, which rejected the Tom Mann's syndicalist approach to trying to work inside existing unions and revolutionise those organisations to setting up their own um, uh, 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 separate dual unionist revolutionary forms of organisation in the, in the shape of the Industrial Workers of Great Britain, which was not really successful. Um, so their influence was, you know, was, very, was quite limited, actually. The, the Social Democratic Federation or party, which then became the British Socialist Party, uh, was a much larger body and it also you know numbers of members played an important role in a number of disputes um, supporting strikes often um, John McLean in Scotland you know uh, some of the women strikers uh, 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 were involved uh, and so on um, again I had an influence um, but um, you know, were caught also by, uh, you know, aspects of their sort of politics. I don't have time, I don't have time really to, go, to go into. The, what, the extent to which this spins out into the wider community, you know, I don't think, you know, clearly they uh, have influence inside working class communities, but although I think both of them um, don't grow particularly uh, in any significant sort of sense. In fact, you know, the British Socialist Party, although it, sound, it promises to, to leap into a sort of a seriously uh, large organisation, um, uh, effectively fritters it away quite rapidly, and the Socialist Labour Party remains uh, quite small. So um, to the extent to which this then, you know, I can't really discern any great sort of uh, advance in terms of commitment to these organisations by a wide by a wider community uh, within within the local areas. That having been said, 
you know, there's unquestionably a radicalisation of political consciousness taking place inside the working class movement amongst a much wider layer of people than are involved in the strikes or involved in the radical left. Um, it may be diffuse, but in terms of notions of industrial unionism, of class solidarity, of a questioning of the existing political system and so on, it seems to me there's no question that a sizable, let's say, minority, not necessarily a majority of British, the British working class, are radicalised. Uh, that may not necessarily manifest itself in terms of membership of an organisation, but it certainly does in terms of their leadership of, you know, for example, the Daily Herald has a, a readership of knocking up to anything between 50 to 150,000, um, uh, uh, you know, sh shows to me signs that uh, uh, workers are ask asking broader, you know, larger, broader questions, as are other uh, members of the community who aren't involved in on strike or in trade unions. Okay, um, Ralph, you'll be pleased to know that, that uh, somebody is, has just started studying employee relations, so it's great to have some examples. So there you go, somebody's going to, to make some instant use of this. Uh, excellent. So uh, well, there's one last question on the chat. Uh, start thinking, folks, if you've got one, because uh, we're, we're beginning to, to wind up otherwise. Uh, an amazing number of mass strikes in a very short period of three years, says John Charlton. With women's militancy and the Irish question, how far off was revolution and what were the obstacles? Um, great, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I'll take it in two parts. I mean, on the one hand, um, of course, you know, when I, in a sense, I've sort of uh, uh, implicitly suggested, um, running alongside this great labour unrest, this magnificent sort of wave of working class uh, uh, struggles was what was equally, in my view, a, a magnificent struggle by women for the vote. And you know, one might argue about the relative merits of the suffragettes versus the, the suffragists, the, the National Women and Suffrage Societies, and other suffrage groups uh, in terms of their tactics and so on and so forth. Um, but it was also a magnificent movement from below uh, that coincided with the, the level of worker struggles. But I think. Um, you know, and I've tried to write about this uh, elsewhere. In fact, I, I gave a talk to, to the uh, society a while back about the relationship between the two. I mean, primarily, you know, these were movements which were extra parliamentary, very militant, came up against the forces of the state, had their leaders arrested and attacked and charged for sedition and so on. There's lots in common with them. Alas, by and large, uh, there was a fundamental gap between them and the two were on sort of twin tracks. Um, I mean, having said that, I don't want to qualify it. And, you know, what the argument I gave at the talk I gave a while back was that there were, there were significant levels of, of cross-fertilisation and links between the two, which I think have not you know, were not previously explored to the degree to which I think they should have been and which I've tried to do. But that doesn't fundamentally alter the fact that generally there was a they were they they weren't combined together. The Irish Revolt is an interesting one, but um, you know obviously it's a very important events in terms of the the fight for home rule in, in the north, which the Liberal government feels committed to have to do in order to cement the support its parliamentary uh, position. Um, and of course, there's a counter mobilisation uh, in Ireland by the Ulster loyalists. Uh, which is then supported by the Conservative Party and sort of reactionary elements of the of the military, which leads to the to the the current mutiny and so on. So all of this is taking place at the all of the you know simultaneous time. But it seems to me the Irish revolt was a revolt uh, from above, if you like, uh, rather than a sort of movement from below. At least in Britain, in terms of you know the the Britain as it were, uh, in terms of these events. So it didn't immediately impinge. The broader question um, is um, to what extent did all of this, these, the, the combination of these revolts and the, the, the limits and the potential of the way in which they cross fertilise with each other, to what extent did they represent a semi-revolutionary challenge? Well, I mean, you know, obviously George Dangerfield in his very, very famous book, uh, uh, the, the, the death of, Strange Death of Liberal England, um, you know, one or two other commentators have sort of suggested that there was a semi-revolutionary situation. I mean, I don't think that that can be justified. Um, 
Um, it, uh, uh, um, however, I also reject the view of some commentators, Henry Pelling and a whole number of other people who've suggested that the strikes were only really of significance insofar as they won immediate wages and conditions, but they had no broader class-based or socialist sort of aspirations. It seems to me um, the strikes did represent a formidable economic and political challenge to society, not necessarily to liberalism per se, but to the government. Um, and in the process that led to a high, very high level of radicalization implicitly. And, you know, there are lots of examples of how that came out. I mean, for example, in some of the dot worker strikes, in fact, in many places across the country, when the dot strikes were on, um, there were, there was, you know, embryonic forms of dual power being created when strikers, strike committees operated sort of permit systems to allow the movement of goods to hospitals and schools and so on, but to prevent it from, from anywhere else. And in, in an implicit sort of challenge to the existing power of a, of a quite a significant scale, uh, if not explicitly articulated and developed upon at the, at the time. So it seems to me there was a genuine radical um, challenge that went well beyond the immediate demands of improvements in wages and conditions, which nominally is what the, the struggles were about. Uh, but actually involved much wider questions about uh, control in the workplace, managerial prerogatives and rights, about the right to justice and liberty and, and, and so on and control inside workers' lives and so on and so forth. Um, but that, in my view, didn't represent, you know, revolution. There was sort of revolutionary sort of aspirations, you know, tendencies amongst a certain, you know, tiny minority of some of those activists, I don't think that could be claimed to have been, a, a, you know, be a, of a, a wider level. And therefore, you know, I, I discount the idea that this was a sort of misrevolution as such, uh, uh, you know, in, in that uh, fashion. Significant as it was, um, um, I don't think it was a revolutionary situation. Okay, well, the, the uh... The, uh, the great thing about these talks is, is the engagement and the, and the great questions from the, uh, from the audience uh, in response to great talks. So um, thank you very much to, to all of you uh, and obviously particularly to Ralph for, for answering so, so thoroughly. I'm, I'm thinking that we are at, at, the, uh, at the end there. Uh, so um, I will draw to a close by saying yes, can you see, if you can see everyone now, Ralph, you'll see the virtual applause coming up. So. <laughs> Thank you. People are appreciating the uh, yeah, not just the pictures, but the amount of research that you have uh, you have put into uh, to uh, informing and educating us today. Thank you very much indeed. Um, would, you be able, would you be able to let me have uh, a copy of the of the group chat because I'm not had a yeah. chance to look at that. Um, yes, I, I will do. It's it, it, it's it's always instructive for the uh, for the speakers. So yeah, it, it arrives for me as a text file. So I'll, I'll send you that. And uh, uh, again, just a reminder to everybody that uh, with luck we've recorded this. And uh, so if you missed the start, or if you want to recommend it to anyone else, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash WCM Library. Um, hopefully later today, as long as Zoom delivers this to me fast enough for me to get it up there. So um, we hope that we will see you all again, uh, this time next week, two o'clock on Wednesday, the 21st of October. And uh, we have Andy Croft, who is going to be talking to us about radical poet Randall Swingler. So uh, another change of mood and, and pace, but uh, of equal interest to you, I'm sure. So um, thanks again, everybody for tuning in. A quick mention again of that donate button on our, um, on our homepage, if, if you uh, feel so inclined. And uh, we will just uh, say goodbye as usual until the same time next week. And I'll say take care in solidarity and best wishes from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Thanks, Luna.